As we unveil Christmas today, we are going to be unwrapping the gift of love. And I cannot think of a more misconstrued topic. There's a lot of confusion within our world as to what love actually is. Some say love is just a feeling. Some say it's just an emotion. Others say it just randomly rises out from within us. Others confuse it with maybe love being solely compassion or the absence of just judgment in one's life. There's so many ideas and so many perspectives and so many views on love, not just within adults, but also within children. One illustrator asked kids what love is and then decided to draw out their answers. Check out this video. Have either of you ever been in love before? Uh, no. I have. I go to school every day with lots of people I love. Do you love Ethan? Yes. And do you love Helena? Uh, not really. Sometimes she'd be mean to me. I'm thinking like of hugs. Here's one person and here's the other person. What's the face like? Eh. Yeah. Like that kind of? Yeah. I love burgers and fries. Burgers and fries? Okay, we'll make some burgers and fries around this heart. What do your friends look like? The one I really love um, has curly hair. What do you think love sounds like? Bump. Love. Because ah! I'm scared of it. A love or a food, Ernie? What do you think it would be? A lollipop with a scorpion inside it. Scorpion looks like that, right? It's like, <laughs> got the tail like that? Yeah. Right? Yeah, and then yeah. the yeah. Yeah. legs. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think it feels like to be in love? Like I'm marrying someone right that second. It makes my whole body ugh, all red and stuff. Yeah, if love were a season, what do you think it would be? Spring. Spring? I mean fall. Fall. Because you like get to see all the leaves fall and the leaves kind of have like designs on them that sometimes look kind of like hearts. Are you scared of love? Um, no, I don't think so. I don't think love's anything to be scared of. Do you love your mommy, your daddy, or Spider-Man the most? Daddy. Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> you think mommy's face looks happy? She looks real happy. No, she doesn't. She looks so angry because I chose you. <laughs> or I can love mommy. We play games with our hearts, buddy. I like both of you. Mommy and my dad. Mommy and daddy. This is what love is. YouTube and my mom fell in love and, and now my dad's running away. I'm scared. Love is a lawyer, pop up a scorpion! <laughs> I love you, Ethan! I love you, Helena! I love you, Mom! I love you! <laughs> love. God commands us to love God and to love others. In fact, Jesus says himself, you know, there's, there's, no, there's really no greater commandment. Love is the driving force as followers of Christ. Love is the driving force behind, behind everything that we do. So given Jesus' command with a world that it, combined with a world that has romanticized and that has sexualized love, it is vital, Foothills family, during this Christmas season that we take time to bring some clarity as to what love actually is. And that's my goal this morning. My goal is to bring clarity, to answer the question, to affirm within some of you what love is and to maybe clarify within others of you, love. In order to do that, I want us to turn to 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. And uh, we'll actually have the verses up on, up on the screen for you. 
this is what the Word of God says about love. He says, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. To begin this section of scripture, John instructs us to to love one another. And John bases this instruction in illuminating within the reader in understanding as to what the source of love actually is. He says, as children of God, we are to love because love is from God. God is the source of all love. He's the origin of love. As one commentator put it, all true love derives from him, which is why everyone who who truly actually loves is born of God. Love sources from God, and it's and it's from God alone. Notice John's words here. It's not. It's not let us love one another for that love is from your, from your husband or love is from your marriage or love is from your education or from your worldview or your religion. No, let us love one another because love is from, it's from God. The source of love comes from God and it comes from God alone. You can't tap into love through your favorite rom-com or through food, Doug, through counseling. You can't tap into love by even listening to me preach. The way you tap into love is by tapping into God. And you see, these delusions of love, they, they contribute They contribute to people's difficulty in being able to understand and begin to exemplify it within their their relationships, within their life context, within their marriages. They're habitually drawing from a cistern, an empty cistern of maybe sex or social media or, or sports. Love is not found in anything that this world can provide, but in the one who created it. John does his best to combat the worldly ideas of love with this qualifying statement here. Notice, whoever loves has been born of God and and knows God. Given the Greek tense, a better translation for that verse would be everyone loving everyone loving has been born of God this verse is not saying that anyone who has experienced love or anyone who has the capacity to love or has given love is born of God as humans you know one of the beautiful things about being made in the image of God is we all hold the capacity to love even the worst most evil people have loving have had loving moments in their life but what john is saying is that those born of god who is love will also love and be characterized by love children of god will love in everything that they do in how they parent in how they interact with their coworkers, and how they shop at the grocery store and how they compete everything they do so here's a simple question you know if would you think about your life or are you loving 
If, if I were to ask your spouse, you know, hey, is so-and-so, are, are you loving? Is he loving? Is she loving? What about your kids? Is your mom loving? Is, is your dad loving? Your boss, your coworkers, is he loving? When people see you or think of you, do they think, man, that is a person of love. It's an important question to have answered because if you aren't, then that means you don't know God. You may think you know God, but, but you don't know God. As John says, whoever does not love, whoever is not loving, does not know God, because God is love. The word there for knowledge, to know God, is gnosko. And you've heard me talk about this, but it's not referring to an academic understanding, an intellectual understanding, a textbook understanding of of what love is. You could, you could get the questions right on a test if someone were to ask you what love is. But what it's talking about is actually an experiential knowledge of love. Parents, you, you firmly understand Gnosko every time you listen to a couple without children talk about what it's like to be a parent, right? You just don't know it until until, friends, until you experience it. Combat veterans, you, you understand this concept of gnosko. It is one thing to learn about combat, to even train for it, but another to actually experience combat. Likewise, many of us can listen to sermon after sermon, engage in Bible study after Bible study, and understand the love of God. But still only the children of God know because they have experienced the eternal, sacrificial love of God. John makes it very clear that Anyone who is not loving is someone who just does not know God. Has not experienced his love. I've had countless conversations with people questioning whether or not they're, they've been saved from hell. Very concerned about their eternity on where they're going to be when they die. And salvation, friends, rests on this gnosko of knowing and responding to God's love. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, Jesus' very own words here. This is Jesus, words coming out of Jesus' mouth says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, you know, did we not prophesy? In other words, did we not preach really good sermons, proclaim really good truths in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name or do mighty works, perform miracles in your name? And then I, Jesus, will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Those who will spend eternity in a hell are those who proclaim truths, are those who, who preach really good sermons, are those who do miracles, those who cast out demons because maybe they intellectually understood Jesus, but they did not know Jesus. So how do you know if you're saved? Well, let me draw you back to that question. Are you loving? Because if you're loving, that means you know God. If you do not love, well, that means you don't know God. 
John continues in his logic by stating that God is love. The reason you know that you are born of God is when you are loving is because God is love. What a statement. God is love. What a statement that flies right into the face of the culture's understanding of love. Love is not some feeling or some emotion or some religious cause or a philosophy in how to live. Love isn't a thing, but it's a who. Those kids were to, were to draw, or that illustrator were to draw a picture of love, he would draw a picture of Jesus. As one scholar put it, we cannot turn this, in, turn this around to say that love is God. Or we can't weaken it by saying that God is loving. As if there were just one of God's attributes was love. Love is not an attribute of God. Love is God's very essence. His very nature is love. There are only three other statements in Scripture concerning what God is in substance and nature. He's spirit. He's light. He's consuming fire. To be loved does not mean that love is one of God's activities or one of his emotions or, or one of his feelings. Instead, God is love means that all of God's activity is actually loving activity. When God creates, he does so out of love. When he judges, he does so out of love. Out of love, Jesus is light, meaning he does not condone sin, but Rather, he shines a light on the sin in our lives and exposes it and calls it out for what it is out of love. And then he consumes that, that sin like a consuming fire without destroying the human or the sinner, but destroying completely the sin. So God's essence being love rejects the world's perspective that love is this absence of judgment or an absence of discipline or punishment. Just as we are human, God is love. Just as being born of human makes us human, if we are born of love, makes us loving. If you're like me, you're probably reflecting back on that question, right? Am I loving? It, is my life characterized as being loving? That's a hard question to answer because even our own perspectives and ideas that we can love influence our answer. So now that we know what love is, that love is God, it's important that we have an understanding of how it is actually manifested in our lives. And there's three manifestations that I want to address this morning, and they're found in verses 9 through 10. Let's read it again. This is how God showed his love among us. This is how God is love, and this is how he manifested or demonstrated or revealed this love, the love of who he is. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Number one, love operates out of freedom. God sent his son. When we read this truth, man, it's, it, it's important that we remember the, the significance behind that statement. God is God. 
no one manipulates God. No one forces God to do, to do anything. God chooses to send his son. Freely chooses to do that. You see, the choosing to, to send, the choosing to send his son, it, that, the choosing carries, carries so much weight, doesn't it? Man, when we propose to our spouse, we, it would mean so much less if we programmed her to respond in a positive way, wouldn't it? Would you marry me? And she just was programmed to say, to say yes. Or we pointed a gun at her head. Would, would you marry me? It, it means so much more that she has, or he has the, the free, or she has, sorry, she has the freedom to respond with yes. As we parent, it means so much more when our kids choose to obey versus being forced or manipulated to obey. One demonstrates obedience out of love and the other demonstrates obedience out of force. You see, love is born out of, out of freedom. God wasn't coerced to send his son. He wasn't forced. He chose to because he loves. Secular psychologist recognized freedom as an essential element to love in her article, What is Love and What It Isn't? She writes this, Love is inherently free. It cannot be bought, it cannot be sold or traded. You cannot make someone love you, nor can you prevent it. Not for any amount of money. Love cannot be imprisoned, nor can it be legislated. Love is not a substance, not a commodity, not even a marketable power source. Love has no territory. It has no borders, no quantifiable mass or energy output. Gosh, does, doesn't that sound like God? <laughs> See, true love operates out of freedom, and this freedom is demonstrated in God's willingness to send his son. God sent his son into the world. Number two, love is expressed through humility. Just as God the Father expresses love through freedom and sending of his son, Jesus displays love by choosing to humble himself, to come into this world, to clothe himself with humanity. God the Father doesn't force his son to do this. Jesus willingly goes, and we see love expressed through, through this humility, all the way to the point of death on the cross. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and be okay became obedient to death, even death on a cross. The humility demonstrated at Christmas of God becoming man reflects the love of God. The U2 star singer Bono grasped the heart of the Christmas story after a tour and attending a Christmas Eve service. He realized, he realized this. Listen to Bono's words here. The idea that God, if there is a force of love and logic in the universe, that it would seek to explain itself is amazing. That it would seek to explain itself by becoming a child born in poverty, in straw, a child, man, wow, just, you know, just the poetry I saw the genius of picking a particular point in time and deciding to turn on this Love needs to find a form. Intimacy needs to be whispered. Love has become an action or something concrete. 
it would have to happen. There must be an incarnation. Love must be made flesh. You too, singer. See, love is expressed through humility. The birth of Jesus is an expression of humility. The advent of Jesus is love being made flesh. You want to see love, all you have to do is look to Jesus. Amazing to think about the willingness of Jesus to clothe himself with humanity. He didn't have to, but he chose to humble himself to the point on a cross. You see, the incarnation was the sacrifice that led to the sacrifice, which leads to the next expression of love, sacrifice. Number three, love involves sacrifice. In this love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The supreme manifestation of God's love is demonstrated in the sending of his son to die for us to take away our sins. By removing our sins, God removed this barrier between him and us, and we could live within him. Brene Brown, a well-known speaker, observed this about sacrifice and love and Christmas. She said this, people want love to be unicorns and rainbows. So then you see Jesus and people say, oh my gosh, love is hard. Love is sacrifice. Love is trouble. Love, love is rebellious. As Leonard Cohen sings, love is not a victory march. It's, it's a broken hallelujah. Love isn't hearts and bows. It's, it is very controversial. In order for forgiveness to really happen, something has to die whether it's your expectations of a person or your ideas about who you are. In all these faith communities where forgiveness is so easy and love is easy, well, gosh, there's just not enough blood on the floor to make sense of that. Love is demonstrated in sacrifice. As John proclaims earlier, for this is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. But God demonstrates his love for us in this, as Paul writes in Romans. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. True love entails sacrifice. Are you loving? Do you operate out of freedom? Do you do you choose to humble yourself after a long day's work to sacrifice the the Thursday night football game, the social media in order to be present with your family. What have you sacrificed? Have you? I love Brene Brown's insight into how sacrifice lays a foundation for forgiveness, as she says. Something has to die for forgiveness and for reconciliation to take place. 
if your relationship with your kids is fractured, what needs to die? If your relationship with your spouse is, is fractured, what, what needs to die? If your relationship with your boss, with those you lead, is fractured, what needs to die? Is it your pride? Is it your, your selfishness? God knew what needed to die in order to bring reconciliation with his children. God sent his son into the world so that we might live through him. On August 16th, 1987, Northwest Airlines flight number 255 crashed just taking off from Detroit, killing 155 people. Yet one survived, a four-year-old girl from Temp, Arizona, named Cecilia. News accounts say that when rescuers found Cecilia, they did not believe she was actually on the plane. Investigators first assumed that Cecilia had been a passenger in one of the cars on the highway in which the airliner crashed into. But when the passenger registered for the flight was, when the passenger registration for the flight was checked, sure enough, there was Cecilia's name. Cecilia survived because even as the plane was falling, Cecilia's mother, Paula, unbuckled her seatbelt got down on her knees in front of her daughter, wrapped her arms and body around Cecilia, and then would not let go. As the first responder found Cecilia wrapped in the mother's body. Nothing could separate that child from her parents' love. No tragedy, no disaster, neither the fall nor the flames that followed, neither height nor death, neither life or death. Such is the love of a Savior that our Savior has for us. He left heaven lowered himself to us, covered us with the sacrifice of his own body to save us. And that mother's sacrifice, man, doesn't that reflect the value of the daughter? The reality, friends, is that the plane of your life has a sin malfunction, and in 80, 90, 30, we don't know, we don't know when, but the plane of our life is gonna crash. And Jesus, out of who he is, freely chooses, knowing that the plane is going to crash, freely chooses to board the plane of our life with the malfunctions and everything within it, freely chooses to board the plane and to make himself available to wrap himself around us. Doesn't his freely choosing to being willing to sacrifice his son for you demonstrate or reflect the value you have to him? 
You're not just some other human. Some of you right now are striving to just keep it together within your life. You're trying to just hold that job together. You're dealing with guilt, anxiety, depression maybe. You've got all sorts of malfunctions going on within the plane of your life. And yet, Jesus sees you for who you are. He understands your value. And he steps onto that plane and makes himself willing, unbuckles the seatbelt, and willing to wrap himself around you into his grip of grace so that when you die or when your plane crashes, he takes the brunt of it, not you. But God, man, God offers this. He makes himself available. He's sitting right there, but he does not force himself onto you. He waits for you to respond. Are you willing to let him? Or are you just going to go down with the plane? And deal with it yourself. If you're choosing for the first time to want to embrace. Because maybe right now in your living room. Or in your car or wherever you are right now. Maybe right now you just came to an experiential understanding. A gnosko knowledge of the love that God has for you. And you want to be wrapped up into the his grip of grace. Would you text a response to me? The number's right there on the screen. Just text me and say, Sam, I want to be wrapped up in Jesus. I receive the gift that he has given me. I receive the love that he has given me. And I'll get in touch with you later on in the week and talk to you a little bit more about what that means. But friends, love is God. It comes only from God. It operates out of freedom, is expressed through humility, and it involves sacrifice. Are you loving? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. And there's nothing that I can say to that really, it, it all just falls short to, 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 the, to the grasp and the understanding of, of what your love truly is and what it means. God, I am so grateful that you are love, that everything you do, all of your activity is loving activity. And how you create and how you reconcile and how you judge and how you discipline. It is so nice to know that as we walk through valleys in our life, as we deal with illness, or we deal with grief, or we deal with addiction, Lord, it's so nice to know that we have a God to fall back on a God who is love, who wants the best for us. Thank you for freely choosing to send your son. Jesus, thank you for humbly clothing yourself with humanity in order to be that sufficient sacrifice to remove the sin in our lives so that we can have an eternal relationship with God. Thank you for being love. So may we reflect it 
May we leave and through our weeks and through our Christmas gatherings and celebrations, may we be loving in all that we do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.